it is amazing how long we do keep things to ourselves. I'm also involved in a charity about domestic abuse and some people have said it's been years and years and years before they've had the courage because they've always thought somehow it must be their fault so I do hope you'll get involved in this research sorry Paul about getting your consultant psychiatrist it's because your name was so difficult I was overcome in trying to get the name right at any rate now I do have a proper consultant psychiatrist to introduce you to which is Dr Chris Professor Doctor Doctor Chris Williams Dr. Chris Willis and the professor, uh, and he is um, an honorary consultant psychiatrist at the University of Glasgow. I've known him a little while, and every time I hear him speak, I want to hear him say more. And today he's going to, um, I think, concentrate on the aspect of cognitive um, aspect of the anxiety and uh, how we can help. So over to you, Chris. Hello, everybody. I just wish I was a psychologist, actually. So. <laughs> One day, it's really nice to see so many people here. I'm just wondering if this is going to keep rotating, and maybe it will. Yeah, let me just pull that. Strange. Anyway, I'll kick off. Um, It'll be able to test our attention if you can try and get this uh, critical flicker uh, from it. Yeah, maybe. Maybe just turn it off. I've not got it plugged in there. I put this in, but that's probably a mistake because it seems to be working for yeah. Maybe it's, yeah, yeah, yeah maybe it, it needs it in. Okay, okay, thank you. Where's the laser on this? I don't actually do the yeah, Okay, we'll leave it. Okay. I'm going to be talking about living life to the full. Good. There's definitely something wrong with this. I'm not quite sure what it is about this, but let's turn this off, I think. Just try and let it settle down for a second. What do you think? No. no. <coughs> Let me just try one last thing. I'll just try and just feed the signal out differently. <coughs> Very strange. I don't know. It was. Yeah, I don't have it on there. I don't have it on the stick there. Okay, let me just talk and just forget the slides a bit and we'll see if they stay up long enough, mm, maybe. Do any of us say things to ourselves like, I always mess things up? Uh, I didn't do anything right this week. We look at the last week, we may have done all sorts of things, but we'll pick out the things, we remember the things where it's gone wrong. Or things will just go from bad to worse. We look to the future and just predict more difficulties, more things going wrong, more things messing up. Or think about the people around us and uh, have the thought that nobody likes me. So we mind read, we second guess what others uh, might think. I think it's pushed in, but anyway. Or do we have really high standards where we try and uh, live by rules that we should always do our best? Or if one th small thing goes wrong, it's as if uh, absolutely terrible, absolutely terrible, everything's been messed up. Or judge ourselves in other ways. I'm so useless, blaming ourselves that it's all my fault if something goes wrong. So all these sort of thoughts can go, uh, get into our heads and go round and round, affecting us in very unhelpful, backfiring ways. Up on the screen is a vicious cycle, and it's drawn as one of those buzz saws that if it uh, turns and uh, uh, rotates, it cuts, it causes damage. And so much when people... When we feel anxious, when we feel down, when we feel angry, when we feel guilty or ashamed, this cycle can spin. And that what we think can affect how we feel emotionally, <clears throat> but also it can affect how we feel physically and also what we do. Can I just give an example uh, of this? Imagine somebody's got anxiety and they've previously felt panicky, for example, on buses or in supermarkets. Let's imagine they're going to the supermarket. And uh, before they set off, they decide, I've got to go shopping, I'm going to go. But there's a slight, slight doubt in the back of their mind about what might happen. So their thoughts begin 
to start to introduce worries about what might happen, will I be able to cope? And maybe as they start to walk towards the shop and get closer, they start to notice the anxiety increasing, the altered feelings. Maybe that anxiety begins to rise. Have you noticed in your own life when anxiety is rising, it's not just mental, emotional feelings. It affects us physically as well. So there may be all those physical reactions we've just heard about, the rapid heart, the sweaty, shaky, clammy, over-breathing, all of these different things. And some of those reactions can make us feel even worse. I won't do this now, but one of the things we often do in uh, various teaching things that we do is encourage people to over-breathe together, for example, because it makes us feel unwell. And some of the things that we do, which are completely normal responses to high levels of anxiety, like breathing faster, to, which is appropriate to get oxygen, into our bloodstream, ready for fight or flight, so our muscles can respond, by overbreathing with rapid, shallow breaths, it very quickly makes us feel unwell. We may feel dizzy, we may feel dry mouth. Our vision can uh, uh, start to feel strange. We can start to be aware of things like floaters. It can go uh, uh, so our vision's unclear. We may start to feel dizzy and cut off from things, depersonalized, so that uh, things seem to come and go. Uh, a little bit, as if we're one step back uh, and not quite connecting. And all of these sensations can reinforce our fears that something terrible is happening right now. And that's one of the hallmarks of panic, this belief that something terrible is happening right now. I'm going to collapse, I'm going to suffocate, I'm going to have a stroke, I'm going to do something to embarrass myself, I'm going to lose control of a projector, or whatever. These different thoughts can pop, build up and up in the person's mind, and if we believe them and focus on them, what we think affects how we feel, so we may become increasingly anxious and panicky. We may notice the physical changes as the adrenaline and the overbreathing kicks in, making us feel worse and worse, and all of it can add up to alter our behaviour. And critically, as we've talked about, certain key things happen again and again. We fall into patterns when anxiety is present. And one of the biggest patterns is avoidance, that things seem scary, therefore we start to avoid them. And we also try to escape. We try to uh, escape and leave quickly situations where we begin to feel scared or that we're not coping or feel overwhelmed. And it's incredibly reinforcing to leave because it makes people feel better. As if we're feeling terrible in a situation uh, and then leave it, choose to escape, we do feel better. The problem is it teaches the rule that the only way of getting through it is by leaving. And the result is we end up in a, in a world that gets slowly smaller and smaller because it ultimately undermines and saps our confidence. And the cycle spins and things get worse and worse. So let's try and think a little bit more about, uh, about what sort of thoughts can occur. Um, this is a worksheet which is freely available on the internet. I'll point you to where you can get worksheets like this on living life to the full. And it's called a bad thought spotter. And... Uh, it's ways of trying to notice and label and be aware of those patterns of thinking that can backfire and make us feel worse. So, for example, some of these unhelpful thinking styles that we can fall into, maybe things we're very familiar with, a bit like old slippers and things, we're very familiar with thinking in these sort of ways over the months, over the years. So, for example, are we sometimes our own worst critic, beating ourselves up, seeing ourselves as failing? Do we focus on the bad stuff? So we may have done lots of positive things in the week or in the day, but we look back and think negatively about those things. Do we have a gloomy view of the future, predicting that things will go from bad to worse, jump to the very worst conclusions that terrible things will occur, or assume that others see us badly, mind reading, or taking responsibility for everything. An example might be, for example, having people round for a a party, a meal, and feeling completely responsible that things have to go right and it's all your responsibility rather than the role of everybody to make an evening event like that a success. Always using words like I always, should, must, ought, got to, revealing often very high standards, uh, which when somebody's under pressure with anxiety or low mood, it can feel like a pressure to maintain those standards. Again, one more thing to see yourself as failing against, one more thing to beat yourself up over. And these thoughts have a bad effect on us, because what we think affects how we feel emotionally and physically and alters what we do. So I'd like to just try an experiment uh, uh, for us to, to try this out a little bit by playing detective, to try and work out what are the patterns we fall into. And I'd like to just describe three everyday situations and just to ask you, just in your twos or threes, just sitting around, just to quickly discuss uh, which of these unhelpful thinking styles 
multiplying these three situations. I'll put the picture of the uh, list of uh, different styles up next. So can you imagine yourself in a situation where you've got to get somewhere for an important meeting at a particular time, and maybe you're driving or on a bus, and for whatever reason you get stuck in a traffic jam. And the minutes are ticking, it's so important that you're there, maybe you have to be there at 10 o'clock tomorrow morning, but you may be a mile and a half away and it's five, 10 to 10, 5 to 10, you're stuck in traffic and can't get there. What would be going through your mind? The second situation is, let's imagine you've gone shopping and you've bought your weekly shop and you've been at Aldi or Tesco or Budgeons, wherever it is that you've been buying things, uh, and uh, you've bought a lot of things and the checkout man or woman's blasted everything through really quickly, you've not kept up with it up with, it with your five pence bags, uh, and just towards the end, one of the bags proves it's not actually worth five pence and splits and there's uh, lots of uh, food going everywhere and you hear someone in the queue behind you tutting. So what would go through your mind in that situation? And maybe if I just do one, one third one. Imagine you've had a physical illness. Maybe you've had a heart attack, angina, a heart problem for many months or years and you wake up one morning and you notice a twinge in your chest. Again, what thoughts might go through your mind? So can you just in twos or threes, just think about this bad thought spotter. Which of these types of responses might describe your own responses? You have to look quickly when it's up there. <laughs> yeah. I'm going to interrupt you uh, just now. It's, uh, it's, great to, it's great to hear you all talking about the football and all these other things. But uh, can I just get a quick hand vote? You're a normal group of people. We're a normal group of people uh, in here with uh, odd exceptions, perhaps, perhaps Paul and... Uh, uh, can we just think about a normal group of people and just do a hand vote to find out whether any of us notice any of these unhelpful thinking styles? Did anyone notice one or two of them? Uh, one or two thinking styles. How about three or four? Quite a lot of hands. How about five or six? Yeah, lots of people. And how about all seven? If you've got all seven, you're probably thinking everyone's looking at you, by the way. You know. <laughs> this is a normal group of people. It's a normal distribution if you're into mathematics. There's relatively fewer people have one or two or three, or five or six or seven, but across the room, virtually everybody had at least one of these. These are normal, common things. So how do we normally deal with these sort of thoughts when these happen? We normally would be able to balance them, move on from them. We wouldn't get caught up in them, but that's the key difference in anxiety and depression, is these sort of thoughts stick and have that impact on us. Can we try an experiment again? People often say, try not to think about it. <laughs> try not to think about your worries. Can we all try really hard not to think about a white I'm going to call it a giraffe, okay? <laughs> Can we try really hard not to think about a white giraffe just for 30 seconds? Let's see how effective it is trying not to think about something. Anyone noticing anything? <laughs> and all the research, Paul's mentioned research, research really matters because research gives understanding, research helps us begin to change things. The research shows Jack Ratman and others in Canada over the years have done lots of research showing that trying hard not to think about things, distressing things, brings them on even more. So we need different strategies for dealing with this. In cognitive behavioural therapy, there's lots of fantastic technical terms to describe it. This isn't quite as Aaron Beck, Professor Aaron Beck, one of the key developers of CBT, developed it, uh, described it. It's the amazing bad thought busting program, the ABTPB, but it's based on CBT principles that labeling the thought, knowing what's happening, recognizing it's a habit that we can fall into again and again, labeling can help, leaving it, stand up to it, give yourself a break and look at things differently. Just in the last uh, three or four minutes, I'm going to just try and go through these. So labelling it is what we've just done just now. It's spotting the patterns, knowing that we're prone as individuals to mind read, catastrophize, beat ourselves up mentally. Knowing those patterns, but sometimes just labelling it can help take the pressure off. Secondly, to leave it. We heard about the idea of mindfulness 
approaches. The idea of not getting caught up in things, the idea of just noticing the thought, but choosing not to go that route of just thinking and thinking and thinking and thinking and thinking our way out of it, which sounds so seductively sensible to try and think your way out of worry, but it can just become like rumination, chewing things over and over. It, doesn't, it feels like problem solving, but doesn't solve the problem. We just feel worse and worse. Problem solving is problem solving. Just rumination just as a cycle that makes us feel exhausted and even worse. So taking a step back and choosing not to go that way. Because these sort of bad thoughts are like celebrities. They love attention. So it's choosing not to go that route. Another way of thinking about bad thoughts is they're very like bullies in a school. And if you think back to your childhood uh, or uh, if you've got children or grandchildren, their experience in schools, if a bully comes up to them wanting their crisp packet or their Kit Kat or uh, their lunch money, what happens if they hand the money over? The bully comes back tomorrow. And it's the same with bad thoughts. Bad thoughts are like bullies. They say you're useless, uh, nobody likes you. They say don't volunteer for things, don't do things, don't go to that party, don't go out for that meal, don't phone a friend. They tell lies. And one of the troubles with these thoughts is they bully people to avoid things, to draw back from people, to do less and less and less. And it means that people fail to realise that actually standing up to them, going to the party, phoning the friend, doing the activity, can be incredibly helpful and quite the opposite of what the bad thought is saying. And if we stand up to bullies, call it bluff, it's an incredibly powerful way of discovering that... Facing fears is actually a very effective way of doing it. Of course, that has to be done in a planned way, sometimes when fears are very strong and overwhelming, but it can be such a powerful, empowering thing to recognise that these bad thoughts tell lies. And you can build accumulating, building up evidence over time by doing these sort of experiments to find that out. Can I ask you to reflect on times when you feel negative and down on yourself? Feeling low, feeling angry, feeling you've messed things up. Do you ever say things to yourself? and talk to yourself inside your head. And if you talk to yourself, do you say encouraging, warm, positive things? Or do you actually say really nasty, critical, horrible things in a nasty tone, the sort of things you'd never want to say to a child or someone you loved? Because it would be undermining, it would damage. And so much of anxiety and depression is we can talk to ourselves in nasty, horrible ways that pulls us down rather than builds us up. So another approach is the idea of using compassionate statements, compassionate mind approaches, to really think about what words of encouragement would someone who really supports you and loves you and wants to encourage you, what would they say? So what words of healing and encouragement would be helpful? And to give yourself a break, in effect, recognising we're OK. Fifth step is to look at things differently. There's so much during anxiety and low mood and anger and upset it feels as if everything's being looked at, all the bad things are being looked at, bit like through a telescope or something like that. We be, lose a wider perspective that other things matter too, that we have strengths, we have people who care for us, there are other things around us that are good. Instead, we'll focus in on all these distressing, difficult things. And it's hard to step back and see the wider picture. And one of the things I really love about CBT is it's done lots of research to find out effective questions to help people take a step back and see things differently. And just to mention two of them, there's more on a website I'll mention later, um, a very effective one is to ask, what, advi what advice would I say to a friend who said the same thing? And I don't know, have you noticed you can sometimes give better advice to other people than to ourselves? And it helps us change the perspective. The other thing would be, uh, you know, what would I have said two months ago before I felt like this? Or what would uh, someone I respect say, for example? It's all just different approaches to try and see things differently. So this is in summary, labelling it, knowing the patterns that we fall into. Because by labelling it, by recognising it, we can choose to respond differently. And for some people, just labelling it switches off the distress. Which I think is really interesting. Just knowing what's going on, being a researcher ourselves, if you like, uh, using uh, uh, the analogy of Paul, just working out why do I feel as I do, for some people, that's enough. But some people need more, so leaving it, choosing not to get caught up in it, taking a step back, allowing the thoughts just to drift by, a bit like a leaf on a stream or a river, to stand up to it, to not be bullied, to do the reverse of what the bad thoughts are saying, to give ourselves a break, to think what compassionate things would be said, and to look at things differently. There are worksheets if you want to try and practice this, together with me going through this in more detail online at livinglifetothefull.com, lltf.com, which is a free access website. Uh, if you want to uh, download these, the worksheets are all 
uh, free on the worksheets uh, address. And uh, that's just a reminder of the different components. I think Thank probably. You Any easy questions? <laughs> or oh, any questions? Uh, question please, and please don't feel you have to stand up as well. If you want, just ask as you're comfortable with it. Put your hand. If you put your hand up, you'll get a microphone. Here we are. Coming. While we're waiting, we have got lots of Chris's little um, chocolate box books that have a lot of what he's just said in a really easy... Oh, yeah, there we go. Yeah, they're all out the front. I five. Lots of different ones. I, I quite like chocolate, I must say. So <laughs> you can probably tell that. Hello, you hear me? Yes, Hi, I Hi. Uh, my name's Iona. Um, thank you um, for your talk. Um, I find, and I would say I'm on the spectrum of anxiety, stroke, that kind of can be low confidence, depression, rather than, you know, I don't want to be glib because I know some people have suffered really terrible things, it's not post traumatic. But I've looked into things like emotional freedom technique, and I've gone from pillar to post actually over the years looking at different things, and it can be quite confusing because rather than really embracing anything and taking it very seriously, you just run from one technique to another. Um, so I'm just curious what you think about that. And, and also the idea of, if people are familiar with the secret Abraham Hicks, this idea of the kind of going into the metaphysical spiritual realm, which is um, that what you focus on becomes you know, more manifest, the idea that you, um, if you put your attention on certain things, the universe, whatever you want to call it, responds in a certain way. And I just wonder what you think about that, because it, it, it could be called positive thinking, yep. or your intuition <laughs> working for you. Okay. Before you write that question, there's another question down there. That's in your mind. Who are you? Where did you come from? Paul Tant, one of the... That's not on. That's not on. Paul Tant, one of the trustees for Triumph for Phobia. Chris, um, in our groups, one of the Exper lived experiences of many of our users as the first step is the hardest step for dealing with anxiety. Any suggestions for the audience if anybody is experiencing from anxiety? Okay, can I li link these two things? It, it takes a lot of energy and motivation to try and change, particularly if symptoms, problems have been really long term. It can be really quite demoralizing trying lots of things a bit and then finding maybe it helps a little bit but not enough. Uh, I think one of the key things is when we've got limited time motivation, effort, all of these things within us to try and make change. I think it really matters to choose things that have a high likelihood of helping. Uh, it's very hard for an individual member of the public or even practitioner sometimes to have an overview of all the evidence base. One of the things I think is incredibly helpful though in the healthcare system are major reviews where lots of experts, uh, expert uh, researchers, but also expert members of the public come together in approaches like National Institute of Clinical Health and Excellence, NICE, and review what the evidence is. Because one of the trouble is, uh, troubles are we tend to pick out bits of evidence that suits us. <laughs> Practitioners do that all the time, and, and also in life we, we can do that. So having a committee that looks at this properly in a systematic, planned way and comes up with conclusions about what on balance do we know works, what on balance do we know isn't so evidence-based. I think if you're going to give things a shot, doing things that have an evidence base would be the thing to go for, uh, so that there's a high likelihood of response. Um, just this idea that Paul's mentioned as well, I think it really matters in coming to a group that it's actually quite scary coming somewhere. It's scary travelling, it's scary making the decision to go, it can be scary walking up the staircase and in through the door, but there's all sorts of fears and concerns about what it'll be like. And there has to be a reason to go and there has to be a reason to bother coming back for the second week. And uh, to me, cognitive behavioural therapy, which underpins a lot of the work that triumphophobia does, because it's evidence-based, is about two things. It's about relationship, and it's about structured working, making changes in a structured, planned way that can be really effective. And I really love the fact that triumphophobia uses groups, because so many people feel lonely, isolated, this is only affecting me, uh, I'm different, I'm damaged, I can't cope. And actually realising that actually these sort of problems of low mood and anxiety are incredibly common. 
And uh, there's a real need for us all to think about life skills and how resilient we are and all of these things. So for me, it's worth coming, even if it's scary, and it's worth connecting with people, even if it's just a tiny thing, a hello, a smile in the first week, and making the commitment to come back the following week. Because it's, there's so many reasons not to come back often. We may be really tired on a particular day. We may feel very negative on a particular day. But some things are worth doing anyway. And I do believe in the power of triumph over phobia groups that they can have big impacts on people. But giving yourself the chance to get the most out of them, even if it feels scary. And tell people it feels scary, because you don't have to say things. You can just sit and listen uh, and learn. There was another element, just the first question. I, I blanked on the second component of it. Uh, Hi, so many things, but um, emotional freedom technique, EFT is supposed to be particularly good with post-traumatic stress and reprogramming the subconscious. That's not what NICE says. Right, interesting. And then this, I mean, some people will be rolling their eyes, but, you know, the universe type stuff that Oprah Winfrey okay. loves. I, I think it would be unwise for practitioners not to take on board people as whole people. One of the things I love about CBT is it looks at beliefs and behaviour. It allows people to have spiritual beliefs of all different sorts and respect that because when people become anxious or depressed or struggle in different ways, those spiritual beliefs can either be a real asset or become part of the problem. So I think it's about whole person assessment but also still using a CBT model whilst respecting the blocks, concerns, fears, etc. that the person has and building on the strengths they have in their own lives and the people supporting them around them to try and get a way of improving things. But I, I would really emphasise, I, I don't just believe CBT is the only way of getting better. There's lots of other ways with an evidence base. But I think if we're going to spend time, we should generally try and seek out first evidence-based approaches. Thank you. And if anyone has benefited from EFT, I'm not saying that you haven't benefited. It's great that you have. But C CBT currently is the most recommended one for panic phobias, for example, in OCD. Yeah. Well, hello, my name's, uh, my name's Melita, I live here in Bath. Um, I have an interest, um, I've suffered from anxiety a lot in my life and I also have just recently finished training as a mindfulness practitioner, which has been incredibly useful to me, I have to say, it's changed my life the last few months. But um, I just wondered, you know, going on that sort of emotional, all the different techniques, I understood it's just somebody, it, it's best to go and just try different things and see what works, because it is such a personal relationship. But I'm understanding you're suggesting that NICE has also pointed out the ones that are more effective and the ones that are not. How do we know that? You know, if somebody's embarking on some sort of therapy, what does one do? Start at the top of the list and work your way down? Because <laughs> there are so many. Uh, slightly off topic, um, Sarah Bannister suffered from anxiety for quite a long time, got sort of complex disorder. Um, uh, as I'm quite sort of young, I was just saying, do you think uh, the rise of social media has meant that more people are displaying signs of anxiety and actually getting stuck in traps so they're hiding behind so images of say, like Instagram and Facebook, where they appear on the outset to be, you know, living the perfect life or, you know, when actually deep down they're actually really struggling and actually maybe that's feeding more, um, more of the so unhelpful thinking patterns and they're actually, as a result, they are getting worse, but they're trying to keep up that persona of trying to live that perfect life but then, do you think um, if enough people almost turn their back on the sort of perfect, ideal way of showing their life and actually displaying their true feelings and thoughts on social media like I have done and I've set up a social media page where I've just started, I've got a blog and I've just started saying how I really feel and actually, maybe if everyone <laughs> sort of started uh, doing that more and actually having, a, having talking about it more and having a conversation about it more, maybe people will be able to actually open up yeah. and um, sort of like maybe then use social media to help them in a sort yeah. of positive feedback. Sorry. <laughs> no, th thank you. We're, we're social beings. 
And uh, you know, people are, people are different. Some people like to keep themselves to themselves or just have one or two close friends. Others like to have lots and lots of people around, around them. We're, we're all very different. But there's still a truth that the attitudes and opinions of other people really matter. And that often gets supercharged when people are doing social media. So social media essentially is about relationship, which should be about connecting and support. And it can genuinely be about that. But it also, as you rightly say, sometimes we can fall into the trap of it being about popularity or attractiveness or having, we're talking about thinking styles where we pick out just the bad things in the week. I think social media, very often the people, people doing a lot of social media uh, will pick out only the good things in the week uh, and everything will be the perfect picture, the perfect happy event, uh, everyone loving it and uh, all of these things and almost judgment by how many likes or uh, all of these things. And actually... Those things don't matter as much as actually connecting and having friends around. I, would, I think it's great for people to speak out about mental illness and other things. I think it's also, though, it's got to be appropriate for the person as to who you talk to. Um, I think the very best people to talk to is often, often family and friends and people we trust who are likely to be supportive and helpful. As I can certainly think of some members of my family I wouldn't necessarily want to trust or talk to because they wouldn't necessarily be that great at it for various reasons reasons and they may many people would be fantastic but others you, you choose who you speak to and I think for blogs and things like that uh, it depends on your role if you're wanting to educate the world it's great to blog but if you're wanting to have honest straightforward conversations with people I'd also say a really effective way of having honest straightforward conversations is just to talk to people that we meet face to face as well yeah and be realistic Can I come back to the other, the other point about this big list? There's often are big lists of possible things that could help. And if you go on the internet, that list would be almost eternal, going on and on and on, because there's so many things that have been suggested. And uh, one of the things I think is really difficult, uh, and it's actually different about the healthcare system in Scotland. In, in Scotland, there's less of an emphasis on giving masses of choice and then choosing one. Uh, I want to just tell a ridiculous story, but it's true from research, actually. Um, I'd like to tell you a story about jam. And uh, this is some researchers in Oregon, this is true, true research, who gave people the choice. They said, you can come into a room where we've got 15 really expensive jams, you know, like mega expensive jams, farmer's market, sort of 12 pounds, 15 pounds each jams or whatever. And you could choose one from 15 or one from five. Who do you think was happier, the people with the big choice or the people with the restricted choice? And it's really interesting, isn't it? Because we live in a society where choice is supposed to be number one. But it's difficult to make choices when you're feeling confused about even what's going on. And to make an informed choice, you need tons of information. Which is why I think, again, NICE is a really good way of coming up with an understanding of seeing the wood from the trees, really. Of, uh, uh, and there were really good summaries that NICE produced, partly f hundreds of pages long for practitioners, but also syntheses, just one or two, it's actually normally four or five pages, for members of the public to try and make recommendations. So I'm absolutely open to the fact that people find lots of different things helpful sometimes, and that's fantastic, often because there's a strong relationship in telling a story, feeling listened to. But having a structured approach on top of that that's evidence-based, can be really, really effective. So mindfulness was mentioned. Mindfulness is recommended by NICE for depression. In recurrent depression, it reduces the risk of having further depression. And that's based on a review of the evidence. Um, and I'm, I'm an academic psychiatrist. I work at the university. I've until recently worked at the university. There's an emphasis on assessing and evaluating. And of course, there are different ways of doing that. People's opinions about things and recommendations and experiences really matter. But also, so do things like, does your rating for anxiety improve? Are you able to go to the shops when it was scary before? These practical things really matter. Can you uh, talk to people that you want to talk to, ask for what you need? These things really matter. And you can measure these and record these as part of scientific trials to find out, does it make a meaningful difference to you? So I would say, yes, there are choices, uh, but also, Generally, if you've only got time for one or two things, I will pick out things that have a strong recommendation for them to invest time and effort and energy. Because all of us have only got limited time and energy, and it's so easy to get overwhelmed with the setbacks. So go for things that could potentially be helpful.
Hi, um, my name's John Calvert-Jones, and uh, I haven't got really experience myself, but I, I know of people who have. So my question is actually, and you touched upon it, going you only go to certain members of your family for advice. How do you, if you know someone who's anxious or low, mm -hmm. how do you become that person to help them rather than then actually making them more anxious by giving them the wrong advice? I think a lot of the time it's just being normal and straightforward and just talking about anxiety in the same way as talking about other things. Um, I think that goes also for practitioners because people sometimes outside of mental health settings get worried or concerned about mental health problems. And it's going to take time, there may be all sorts of fantasies that, uh, about it, maybe people will be upset and I won't know what to do. I think there's a huge need for us to all get comfortable talking about feelings more. Uh, and that includes sometimes healthcare practitioners. And one of the things I think is really important about CBT is you can actually access it these days in lots of different ways. You can go to triumphophobia groups, you can uh, uh, have support online, you can have uh, uh, support by reading books, you can have support by seeing a practitioner. But all of them have certain things in common. And one of the key elements of CBT is it helps people help themselves. It's about teaching people ways of working out why do I feel as I do, so it demystifies. So rather than feeling overwhelmed by symptoms, it's possible to give a, a model of why it makes sense. Why do I feel angry, guilty, sad? Why am I obsessive? Why do I have these symptoms? How are they affecting me? Not just to feel worse, but to understand it to give targets for change. And the strength of CBT and other evidence-based psychotherapies is it has tools and techniques to make changes in these targeted areas that keep the cycle spinning.